Welcome back to the IU427 Garage, everybody. Today, another little update on Jim's car. All right, everybody, back on Jim's car. We've probably got uh, one or two more days that uh, it'll be up here on the lift, and then it has to come off. We need to get the 25th anniversary car back up on the lift because we have a date with the first start for that car, and uh, we don't want to miss that. So we'll be back on that car probably in the next video. However, some unfinished business on Jim's car. Um, I mentioned uh, the, the rear end. Um, drain plug in the last video but I never got back to it and so with all of the issues that we found behind the dash um, I had it on my list but it just never made it into the video so I addressed that today I uh, replaced the uh, the pipe plug that was in there and I put in a oh what, are the, what do you want to call this an, like an allen allen head this one is magnetic and so is the stock one on the other side of the differential where you fill this from. Now, this one does have an upper fill plug and it looks to be in about the spot that the one on the front of the differential is as well. I never fill from back here. I was always taught to fill these from the front from the factory drain plug, uh, which isn't really a drain plug, it's a fill plug. But um, that way you know that you're at the proper level. So basically you just can continue to put fluid until uh, it starts dripping out and then you know it's full. Um, you don't want to overfill these. Now, there are some of these covers that end up having a plug like up here. Do not fill from up there. If you fill your rear end housing all the way up to the top like that you're going to push fluid out of your seals on the end of the axles so there's a reason that you're only supposed to fill it up to the factory um, specified line on the front of the differential housing so that's all done i got that in i put a little bit of uh, thread sealant on there i did the same thing to the front fill plug this one doesn't seem to be uh leaking and so i just i, I just felt it was better just to leave it alone so I did end up putting about, oh, maybe three quarters of a quart. Into the rear end. Now, that, that, that drain plug on the bottom was leaking. We could see that it was leaking. And when I pulled the old one out, it was merely just a cast iron pipe plug, like for plumbing. Um, it was loose. It wasn't hand tight loose, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't wrench tight either. Um, someone had a, had attempted to you know tighten it in there, but then never got it tight. So that's why I think it was leaking. It wasn't properly sealed either. There wasn't there was some sealing on it, but there wasn't a lot. And you can see when I put sealing on, I'd rather have it ooze out or push its way out of the threads and know it's sealed than put too little on it and hope it seals. So that's done. Um, and then uh, what, what I want to do is uh, probably tomorrow night, um, some interesting conversations uh, come up while, you know, you're working with a buddy in the shop. And uh, so I want to address that tomorrow night. So, all right, everybody, I'm going to um, show you what it takes. Now, I have, and this isn't, a hey look at me and all the cool tools I have um, but I have pretty much every socket imaginable in my main socket drawer okay so standards quarter inch 3 8 half inch drive metrics quarter inch 3 8 half inch drive a collection of different 
ratchet heads, extensions, universal joints, okay? That's just the main drawer. So over in the toolbox up over here, I have another socket set. This one is primarily 12 point sockets until you get down into the quarter and stuff and then, then it becomes 6 point. But I also have all of the Allen key, all the Torx, all of the square drive, the um, Phillips and straight blade tips that you can put in the end of your socket ratchet. But wait, there's more! And again, don't take this the wrong way. I've built this tool collection over 30 some odd years, 35 years, okay? I have wrenches and sockets in other drawers over here. Wrenches, more wrenches. While I was pulling out, or while Anthony was pulling out, that inertia switch, we could not find a socket that would fit over that quarter inch tech screw, is what these were, that he could get a decent grip with. And so he says, do you have any cheap sockets? And yes, I do. On my blue work truck, I have a set that I buy, or that I bought, primarily just for going to the junkyard. I figured if I lose a piece out of this, it's not gonna break my heart. I didn't spend a fortune on the toolkit. So when one of the local auto parts stores well, was getting ready to go out of business, I purchased a toolkit from them. Now you can get these at some of the other places, but for whatever reason, this one was inexpensive. I think it was maybe $35 for the entire kit. Okay, not bad quality. I've never complained about the quality of the tools. It's always done everything I need it to do when I go to the junkyard. But we needed a cheap socket, and Anthony reminded me of this. On your more inexpensive sockets, they're less apt to be rounded over on the inside of the socket. They're more flat. And so it actually will give you more surface area to contact whatever the bolt. So if, for instance, your bolt is rounded over, on the edges you know like in this case they were put in with quarter inch tech screws and that's just the quarter inch head I'm referring to but um, so if someone put that in with an impact driver or a drill or something like that to drill that screw that self drilling screw in they may have rounded the head a little bit and so that's why we were having an issue getting them out and so this cheap socket this inexpensive socket I should call it did the trick it went on there and probably after about 10 minutes of giving this socket to Anthony to use versus the one that we were using out of my main socket set, he was able to spin those things off and we got that inertia switch out of the way. So, while well, I'll preach to you and tell you to buy good quality tools and buy them once, sometimes you're just going to find that these inexpensive tools can fit, fit, fit a purpose too. Like in this case, it just fit on those self-tapping screws better than the more expensive sockets that I have over in the drawer. All right, so I got home a little early today and I guess while I was in here working and had probably the music on way too loud, um, Jim stopped by and Jim dropped off some parts. So we now have the parts to hopefully finish off the rest of the cooling system on Jim, on Jim's car. Cooling system different on 25th anniversary car, this is Jim's car. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna place one of these in line in the upper radiator hose and then we're gonna put our temperature sensor in here. This one also has a ground terminal, it's on the bottom. On, I haven't unwrapped this yet, but it's on the other side of this, this uh, fitting and it has a threaded um, hole in it so you can land a ground and I wanted to make sure we had that I didn't want to rely on the um, continuity of the coolant to carry our ground because when you're dealing with and this is just my own kind of superstition 
kind of feeling. We've got a cast iron block. We have aluminum heads and we have an aluminum radiator. And when you have all of those dissimilar metals, now the, the, the coolant is supposed to reduce any electrolysis and that is uh, dis dissimilar metals coming in contact with another other they, they corrode one another so there is water in the coolant that carries it but it's distilled meaning there's no there's no um, uh, hard minerals in the water that they mix the coolant with so it shouldn't be carrying electrolysis but because I've been in the electrical field for so long I know that you know stuff happens and so I would just as soon ground that sensor right at that fitting rather than relying on the ground that's on the engine or on the radiator through the coolant flow, etc., etc., and then reduce the effects of electrolysis over time so that we don't corrode the radiator, we don't corrode the engine block, and we don't corrode any of the other internal parts, water pumps, etc. So that's why we went with this one. There were other ones on the market that didn't have that ground built on it and I just didn't want to go that route and have issues down the line so that's why we chose this one the other thing that Jim dropped off was this speed hut uh, reset button so as I pointed out in the last video this plugs into the back of each one of the gauges that has one of these eighth inch jacks and then there is a push button a momentary push button on the end of it and by cycling that push button you can adjust the clock on the clock you can adjust the revolutions per cycle for a tachometer you can address uh, address the uh, trip um, oh what is it the the trip odometer for the the speedometer etc I mean right right on down the line so you only need one button because it's easy to remove it from the back of the gauges if you have access Jim's clock isn't in the easiest position to get to. I had him order this just for setting the clock because we've had the, dis the battery disconnected for so long now that the clock is, is you know, it's right twice a day, but it's not going to be at the right time when we reconnect the battery for the final time. And so I want to be able to adjust it easily. And then we'll just leave this stowed behind the dash. And then he can, whenever he needs to replace a battery or adjust the clock, then he can have access to it and, and adjust the clock that way as well. And then if he ever wants to use the trip odometer, you know, he could unplug it from the back of the, the, uh, the, uh, the clock and use it over there. Or he can just order another button. I think they're only like $10. Um, when you order the gauges separately and not in a package of gauges, they send you one for each gauge. But if you order the, the gauges as a set, you only get one. So there's, a, there's your little tip for the day. All right, everybody. So here is the split loom with the sensor wire and the ground that we ran through the firewall extension into the engine bay of the car. And you can see it comes up to a cushion clip there, goes around the back of the heater hose, another cushion clip, another cushion clip, another cushion clip towards the front. So let me go around to the other side of the car and I'll show you what we did in order to get a sensor in here. All right, so I already showed you the part on the bench, but this is what it looks like in line. So basically what we did is we cut the upper cooling hose going to the radiator right here, and then cut out a section of it so we could fit our fitting in there. It's basically a coupling with a sensor bung and then a ground terminal right here. Now this ground is a stud, so I went ahead and I put some Loctite on that. Put the stud into the aluminum. That'll keep it from one, corroding, and two, keep it from backing out. And then there's a nut and a ring terminal on there with our ground. And then I just put a uh, female spade connector on the other side for our sensor. I want to keep it as simple and clean as we can. So everything's tightened back up. I've refilled the coolant in here. I did have to drain about, oh, half gallon or so, just so we could uh, get the level below what we were doing with the hose. And it's all put back together right now. So... I think with that, I'm going to close this one out here. All right, I think that's going to do it for today. Um, as always, I want to thank everyone for watching. If you're enjoying the content, please do the like, the share, the subscribe, all that good stuff. We'll see you next time. Have a great day.